es duplicada? Okay, so I think we can start uh, our uh, second session for today. And uh, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, our second uh, keynote speaker, Uwe. Uh, Uwe graduated from uh, computer science in 96 uh, had, with a minor in biology, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, so he already had, I guess, the, the vision there, and we need to do it together. Uh, then a PhD in computer science in 2002 uh, from Nuremberg in Germany, of course. Uh, he did his postdoc with Chris Burge, one of the uh, most prominent researchers in the RNA splicing um, area. And I think that probably influenced heavily your bias towards RNA processing and interest in post-inscriptional regulation. Uh, he got tenured as a professor at Duke in 2011, and uh, I think shortly after, in 2012, moved back to Germany, where he has been uh, ever since in Berlin. Uh, he has won numerous awards, Sloan uh, NSF Career Award, uh, NIH Transformation, Transformative Research, uh, and, and others. Uh, but I think more importantly, he's been one of the most prominent uh, research in this area of uh, bringing in applied machine learning for looking at gene regulation in general, but with a heavy bias toward RNA um, uh, processing, post-inscriptional regulation, worked on microRNAs, worked on alternative polyidentylation, worked on splicing, and uh, I guess we're gonna hear a lot about it today. So thank you very much for uh, coming and we look forward to your talk. Well, thank you, Yusuf, and also the other organizers for inviting me here to Basel this time. Um, I realized this is, I went to my first ISMB 20 years ago, and I spent a good part of my time trying to buy clothes because I stayed in a, in a youth hostel. I was very naive, and I thought, oh, I need to save money for this poor foundation that uh, paid my salary. Yeah, uh, so I stayed in the youth hostel, and I was this guy who was like, ah, oh, damn, I've been traveling for months around the world, and I run out of clothes, and I really don't have money to go shopping, and later that evening, I came back, and everything was gone. And um, interestingly, for you will appreciate this, it was a Sunday in Germany, so I couldn't even buy anything. I remember I got a, a Fruit Fly t-shirt, because I was working at the Fruit Fly Genome Project, and I could find a toothbrush at the train station, but there was nothing else to be gained. So nothing like that has happened so far, so... Let's see if I make it to the airport with all my stuff this time. All right. Um, so we are interested, as um, Josef mentioned, to, in gene regulation in eukaryotes in general. All of us are here, or many of us also in this RNA meeting, are working in this direction. And of course, the big question there is, how do we have one genome that actually generates a multitude of different cell types? And can we actually find out what the changes are 
that might lead to errors in this process? And this is really not a new question, right? I mean, large-scale initiatives like ENCODE and so forth have driven this forward, but it's really the idea that comes back to also Eric Davidson and colleagues in the 60s, or here Mary Claire King in mid-70s already saying, well, changes also that drive evolution might often not be in the protein coding genes, but actually in the regions that regulate them. And so the question for us then that's always in the background is, well, it's well-working tools now to interpret coding variants, and this is where we are now. We are sequencing whole genomes routinely now, especially in the context, for instance, of rare diseases. But interpreting non-coding mutations is really still in its infancy. And I think this is what we'll see and where we saw talks here also at these meetings, I think, where with the data that we have and with the tools that we have, we're actually making a lot of progress these days. And so, as we all know, really, transcription is this little unimportant process that starts things off, and then the interesting stuff's really happening. And this includes, of course, everything from processing, export, stability, localization, translation, and so forth. And genomics allows us both to look at the regulatory interactions that drive these processes, so how do RNA-binding proteins and non-coding RNAs interact with their targets, but also now increasingly to profile what happens to the mRNAs or the link RNAs at each step along this cascade. So we can profile nascent transcription or half-life, as we heard yesterday, um, where exactly polymerization occurs, how efficiently things are translated, and so forth. And so I'll tell you both sides of the story a little bit. We work on both sides. Spend most of the time actually on the RNA binding protein interaction targeting part, and a little bit in the end also on translation. So to bring everybody on the same page, I mean, by now these charts are already getting a bit old, but essentially when people started doing targeted proteomics to isolate the proteins and, and identify the proteins that are stuck to RNA. This happened on a large scale, sort of about eight years ago by now. We we're quite in for a big surprise because the numbers that people found were even higher than we already knew. So we have definitely over a thousand RNA binding proteins. These are the more classical ones with recognizable domains, as you can see here. And there's a lot of other proteins that are found in these screens that might have to do with metabolism and so forth, and where they're not really the classical um, RNA binding proteins. I'll focus today on those that actually have sequence specific information to find and interact with their target RNAs. And it's a bit more enigmatic than transcription because RNA binding proteins can often influence multiple processes in different compartments in the cell. So often you just read, oh, it's doing, you know, it's controlling processing, stability, expert, and also a bit of translation. You're like, okay, what's left out? What's this thing not doing? And so that's a challenge, and that's often also driven by those proteins having multiple domains. So sometimes you might actually think, yes, multiple roles and different interactions with different partners are absolutely possible. And um, people are increasingly realizing that, of course, there are mutations either in the proteins themselves or in the target sites that are actually behind uh, congenital disorders, for instance, on many, many different levels here. And so um, it's important to look at these. And so we do this in, our, uh, in my lab in different levels. So if you think about RNA binding proteins and what are the challenges that you're facing, it starts with actually identifying these RNA binding proteins where we were, for instance, involved in a pro uh, project to find that out in Drosophila. We want to map the actual targets and identify the interaction sites of the RNA binding proteins. We want to derive what are the specificities in the sequence of structure or whatever else that actually makes these proteins recognize their targets. And once we've done all of that, we might actually be able to put these things together into regulatory networks. Um, and in my first part today, I'll essentially focus on the right side here. I'll tell you a little bit about a background about what these CLIP experiments actually look like, that people use cross-linking and immunoprecipitation to look at the interactions of these RNA-binding proteins, and then actually go to something that's on bioarchive and in a revision already, where we actually throw a lot of data together and do, of course, machine learning. At least I can say I've been doing this for 20 years, so it's not really a new thing, especially in computational biology. Machine learning has been around. There would be no genome annotation and you know, nice, nice annotations of where all the genes are in genomes and to transfer that information to newly sequenced species and so forth. It's a field that has a really long history in molecular biology, and especially at this meeting. But of course, it became really popular in other application domains recently, and mostly driven because it is, um, or the idea is that you have massive amounts of data, that you have the compute power to analyze that data with architectures like GPUs, 
and that this allows us both of these things together with new and appropriate algorithms allow us to really build very large model structures, for instance, deep networks. But the question really is if this is true for biological and medical data. The hope behind this is that we get, of course, improved performance, that's nice, but ideally also end-to-end -end processing, right? The idea for many of these deep learning architectures is I just throw images at it, and I don't need to do any pre-processing because there's so much data that lighting and orientation and occlusion and all of these things don't really matter. Now, if that's the case for biology, that's something I'm, I'm up for arguing. I think there are, we are getting data sets where this is possible. I'm a bit reluctant to say that noisy clip data sets belong into that class where I would naively just throw all the data into a big model. Um, yeah, and I like this particular quote, why would we, however, want to use machine learning? Um, in a way, we are not using machine learning just to um, speed up human processes, right, or take away our cars from us and drive them themselves, but we, we use this to find out new things, right? I mean, this is the interesting thing of machine learning and research. And this is a quote from Brandon Fry, who some people here know very well. Um, and he made sort of this interesting comment that I thought was really cheeky at first, but I think he actually got at this point here that, you know, to understand or use machine learning in, in biology, you actually hope that you achieve something like superhuman intelligence, right? Because we're not just replacing our visual system with a computer that's better and faster at reacting to certain situations, but rather to actually solve problems that we weren't really programmed in evolution to actually solve with our brains, right? That just as a bit of food for thought. Back to actual data. So the data that we use is RNA um, protein interaction data, and that comes from immunoprecipitation. This started off with RNA immunoprecipitation, where you would have still arrays, like back in the late 90s, essentially, with a few target regions. You would pull down the RNAs that were bound by a specific protein via an antibody against this protein. You hybridize the fragments, and you would be able to find out um, which sequences, which genes, which transcripts were actually targeted, but of course didn't have spatial resolution. And this changed. When sequencing came along, especially from Bob Darnell's lab, Yanni Ule and other colleagues there, um, developed um, cross-linking and immunoprecipitation, where you now um, actually digest away the fragments that are um, not covered by the RNA-binding proteins after you cross-linked it, and you sequence just these smaller fragments. And so then, of course, you get a much better resolution. And there's tons of different CLIP protocols out there, but they all actually have something what we call diagnostic mutations. So in this case, for instance, because there is a little bit of a, a small part of your a peptide of your protein is actually stuck during cross-linking, this leads to errors, increased error rates in the reverse transcription when you actually do your library preparation. And so these are diagnostic mutations that can help you actually find out where the true target sites are. And so just to um, illustrate this, we would have reads, we align them to the genome, but in addition to um, just the reads and the read profiles that we also have, for instance, in CHIP, we have these little red dots in here, which are mismatches that were introduced to the cross-linking. And this um, protocol called Parclip, this is specifically T2C mutations, because you also use uh, an, a nucleotide analog for SU to increase the cross-linking efficiency. And so what you get then is not just a read profile. Let me see if I press the right button. Ha, yes. You don't just get a read profile here in gray where the reads align. That would, of course, be already nice and allow you to identify target sites with uh, peak finders. But you actually also get, essentially, these diagnostic events, in this case, these T2C conversion rates, and they are even at a higher resolution here, right? And so they often delineate with the data as nice, very precisely where interactions are. And here, in this case, these local optima here in the T2C conversion density actually really coincides also where the functional motif of this particular protein is localized. So in good data sets, if you went to Julia Zeitlinger's talk, for instance, this almost looks like chip exo data. But as we'll see, there's other problems that come along the way. So we recently, actually, we had one of the earliest peak finders for Parklip data several years ago, and we revisited this problem because now with many different uh, CLIP protocols, these uh, diagnostic events look different than these different protocols, and you don't want to reinvent and build a new CLIP finder every time somebody modifies your protocol. And so 
Um, to illustrate this here now, what the problem is, you have these diagnostic events and you have the read density, and you also have, of course, the actual expression levels, and hopefully you have this all in replicate information. So we want to have um, a clip finder that is um, tolerant or can take in different types of diagnostic events. And then the other big confounder, of course, is expression levels. Um, a chip peak caller will assume that yeah, you have two alleles, right, on your chromosomes, and here we don't know if an RNA is expressed at low levels or high levels, and if this means that the same number of reads that come from your immunoprecipitation experiments mean that pretty much the whole population of these RNAs is bound, and this is a strong binding site, or if it's actually just a small fraction of them, and this should actually be much more weakly scored as a functional site. Yeah, so RNA expression is the big confounder here, and in fact, local RNA expression, because the coverage also varies along the genome or along the transcripts when you align them. And so we put this all together in a probabilistic hierarchical model that has components now to actually account for the coverage, for the diagnostic events, so you have a multinomial about all kinds of transitions, transversions, deletions, read starts, and what else can appear. You put this together in a hidden Markov model that goes from background to sort of flanking regions and the actual peaks, like you can see here, right? You have background, then you start seeing some reads, but you're not quite sure yet, and at some point here you think this is where the actual um, peak occurred, the interaction occurred. And because, of course, you have multiple diagnostic events, but they are separated by several nucleotides, you need to keep this a bit in memory, whether you've seen diagnostic events recently. And so this is actually a non-homogeneous Markov model where we change the transition probability based on how many diagnostic events we've recently seen. Yeah. And so not your little run-of-the-mill script to process the data. What does this give you? It gives you, just to, as a little vignette, if you rank essentially your peaks um, by the score that you give them and see um, do the top scoring motifs, if you rank them by the quality that you assign to them, actually contain a known motif, you can see that our peaks simply contain more known motifs, the ones that we think are the best, than other peak callers do, including our own previous ones. And why is that? Because if we um, bin genes by expression, you can see that the other peak callers actually often call things simply because it's highly expressed and you have a few reads on highly expressed transcripts. And if you don't account for the actual gene expression properly like we do now, you actually start calling peaks simply because the, the RNA is abundant. And what you see in our approach is that we have many more peaks actually in the sort of middle and lower expression range that with proper inclusion of replicates that I skipped um, is actually that you're, that you're able to now find. Okay, and so we used all of this now to go back, these kind of frameworks, to go back to, in our case, all of the Parklip data that was available about two years ago and started processing them with these tools through a common pipeline. In a way, this mirrors a, a, a sub-project of ENCODE where uh, Jin Yao and Chris Burge and colleagues actually profiled about 200 RBPs in two of the ENCODE cell lines. Ours is a different cell line, and there's very little overlap in the number of in the, in the proteins that we actually profiled. It's a different cell line, and it's a different protocol. Ours is all the Parklip data that was done, for instance, a lot here by Michaela also, who's going to maybe talk about this later today. Um, is a flag-tagged uh, transgenic cell line. So the protein is expressed at the same level, and it's always the same antibody. It's an anti-flag IP. And so no matter if... So we don't have variability, for instance, in the quality of the antibody, right? Of course, then you start expressing things that are maybe not expressed in that natural context in that cell line. So both of these things have some pros and some cons. And we can now go in and create these nice maps that you also see in ENCODE. We call this our little private ENCODE project where you start essentially clustering, in this case, somewhere between 50 and 60 RBPs by where they actually occur, what they like to bind to, which particular RNAs they like to interact with. So, for instance, there are clusters then in here that go to tRNA, so where most of the targets of these proteins are actually different species, no RNAs, tRNAs of, um, of RNAs, but then also um, where they actually occur. So here's a cluster that is mostly intronic and 3' UTR binding, and you can see that here in these heat maps where, in fact, these proteins bind. And then for splice factors, for instance, you see that they like to bind right, of course, close to the splice sites and so forth. And so that's a resource now that is available, that is in our database, Dorina, that we have in Berlin, where we include all the Parklip experiments. And so if you 
think you have, for instance, you have a better model like the one that I'm going to explain to you now, you can actually use the exact same data. This is what we used in the next step. All right, so back to the machine learning. Now we have this large data set. What can we do with this? Um, there's a problem a bit what would be negative data that's good, and so we actually phrase the problem in the following way, and this is always an important part in machine learning. Think about which problem you're actually solving and exactly how do you phrase the problem. What we are doing is we give essentially a transcript and we want to know which is any and which RBP is binding at any position in that transcript. So it's a multitask learning problem, we want to predict which of the 50 or 60 RBPs is actually uh, binding at any given position. Our positive data is then essentially the clip peaks, process clip peaks that we use, so simply yes or no for a specific RBP. And the negative data are simply the peaks of the other RBPs. Remember, that's going to be important in a few slides. And it also solves the problem what the negative data would be, of course. So I'm sure most of you have seen deep learning talks here at this conference also, and of course in the past. Um, if you use sequence information just to take you to a standard architecture, what you often see is the so-called one-hot encoding that you specify your input sequence with. Uh, you have convolutional layers that essentially work as little filters to detect small sequence motifs. You have a bank of this that would essentially scan, often in an invariant way, because you have a max pooling step, where that if, if and which of these small sequence motifs occurred in your sequence, and then you have some other follow-up layers that essentially are able to combine this information. And so here we have actually a fairly large number of um, convolutional filters in there because we throw all the data for several dozen proteins in there. And so this convolution filter is supposed to, these filters are supposed to represent the full compendium of RBPs that we're working with. And the specific architecture that we use actually uses additionally region information, so similar to what hot encoding and annotation of the nucleotides, are they in an intron or an exon and so forth, and because I mentioned, right, RNA binding proteins are supposed to work on very different levels, this is very useful information for the network to know are you actually in an intronic or an exonic part of the sequence. We also use slightly more complicated architectures. In this case, it's a gated recurrent unit, um, which means you have a memory. It's one of these recurrent neural networks that actually lets you store a little bit of background knowledge that you've seen recently. And then our output layer is really a 50-some dimensional vector for each RBPs, yes or no, did you bind here? You have to show some RO seekers, so I do too. How do they look? Well, okay, right? There are some that look really nice, like 0.98. You're like, ooh, happy. This is the area under precision recall, which is always the one that people are, sensible people want to also see. Not 0.94. You're like, oh, I'm done, right? Muscle blind. We're good to go. And then you see other factors here, and you think like, yeah, 0.79, better than random for sure. The area under precision recall kind of drops, and you're like, what is this? So my postdoc working on this, uh, Masa, when she saw that first, you're like, what is this crappy data, and so forth, or it doesn't work, and so forth. And so we started looking into this a bit more, and I think this is where it starts getting interesting. So muscle blind is a case. If you actually see how this network now scores the clip peaks, would it recognize what scores does it actually give to our peaks that are annotated as being bound by muscle blind? And what are other regions actually, does it also recognize other regions that are not scored, uh, not annotated as muscle blind? So here's the background set, mostly given a score of zero, as it should be, with some tail, because you might have missing sites. You had all this talk yesterday, maybe, hopefully. And then the positive sites are actually scored mostly. You have some tail here, and you think, okay, it's a little bit of background. Maybe there's some sequences in there that are false positives. And you can look into the top scoring and the bottom scoring peaks and look at the motifs and don't go into the details here. And you see essentially that the right motifs are enriched here and that you don't find the true muscle blind target sites represented in the peaks here. Now, if you start looking at the um, proteins where the model has some more issues with, the picture looks really different. Yeah? So now the negative and the positive set are almost not that separable anymore. There are very few peaks that are actually annotated as positive. 
And also in terms of the motifs, you start seeing that there's also some other stuff coming on. But if you look at the few peaks that are actually positive, so above 0.5 is what we had as uh, our top 10% here in this case of the peaks, you still see sort of motifs coming up. So CPSF is involved in polyadenylation and cleavage. And so you see things that look like the poly A site coming up too. So we thought, mm, maybe that's still actually helpful. Maybe this network actually still learned something. And we can still work with this, even though most of the data is actually indiscriminate from, from background, from negative data. Before I try to convince you that this actually really works and is useful, even though the ROCs don't look that good, um, we, of course, want to interpret these networks now, right? Our goal is to go in and actually see and score variants or binding sites and find motifs and so forth. And previously, people often looked at these convolutional layers, and these are the convolutional layers in our network, and you think, holy moly, right? There's no nice position weight matrix-like logo that's represented here in these convolutional layers. So why is that? Well, we actually have, like I said, several dozen proteins to learn, so it's a much harder task, and the network has many more motifs or filters to work with than if you learn one protein at a time. Um, and so the information gets distributed out like crazy. You would think, you know, muscle blind, if you have a 0.97 ROC, shouldn't there be a motif that looks like muscle blind in there? And the answer is actually not. So you cannot interpret this multitask network by going to the convolutional layers. What you need to do, which is what I've also seen in many talks here, is to go back to the input sequence. And so you use methods, in our case, like uh, integrated gradients, um, to build these attribution maps that tell you what were the most important input features that led the network to decide for this particular class? And now if you look at this, this is actually really nice and beautiful, right? And so even though the information is distributed in a way that we cannot interpret, hmm, superhuman intelligence and such, it's actually in the network. And if you go back to the input sequence, you see in this case this ORF1 motif, you see the PUM2 motif, and here's the power of these neural networks. In this case, there's always one side. Here, there's often two sites, which might be more degenerate. You don't need to specify that information up front. It just comes out of the network. And we can see more complicated things come up, too. So here's muscle blind, another one of these repetitive patterns, where in some regions, you start seeing three, four, five instances of the motif. And then you start seeing, actually, things that we also have with RNA-binding proteins, that you often have these dinucleotide stretches. So there's not one motif well delineated that's actually there anymore. It's rather this whole docking platform, or however you want to call these stretches, and it finds those as well. Yeah? And it might even find things that are more composite motifs. And so this is, again, CPSF6. Look at the numbers here. These were essentially 270 um, well-scored input sequences, and 17,000 where the network thought this is actually not fitting, but out of these 270, it gets enough information to find the proper motifs. And you, in this case, don't find just one motif, but two, because it's close to the polyadenylation site. So you see, actually, composite motif light up, so you, it uses the information in the context around it. We give 50 nucleotide flanking regions next to the clip peaks. And you can see that also other information is actually pulled out. But the resolution is high enough that you can go back in. Here is where the actual clip peaks were in this case. Um, and you can see that more or less it's pretty clear what the actual motif is and that this is a secondary motif that's actually not in the center of the cross-linked area. Yeah? And you can derive, which I'm not going into, they can do post-processing on the motifs that you see in these attribution maps and essentially build a motif finder that actually gives you logos like this then also back. And I've seen that also in another talk already for transcription factors, so this works in this case too. Um, I want to finish this part just with a note of caution. Um, I mentioned we phrased this as a multitask learning problem. So we're learning across all proteins at once. And this is actually a really important step to do. And I can show you why in this image here. Here you have a few diff uh, couple of different input regions, so one and two here. Here is what our multitask learner, the attribution maps, look like. Here are attribution maps if we learn two different single tasks, so just this protein against two different choices of negative sets. That's why there are two models here. And you can see it looks much worse. Why is that? It is because clip data is super noisy, 
And so if you don't give it multiple data sets, it cannot discriminate what the bias in your experimental data is. It will start learning biases that are present at clip peaks and not at background data sets, but not the actual motif. The strong bias in these parklip data sets, and in fact in the early ones, is the signature of the RNAs that likes to cleave next to Gs. Yeah? And in these architectures, you can see that the actual motif is not visible anymore. It starts becoming invisible. And what this network learns is that you have a bunch of Gs at uh, clip peaks, at the borders of the clip peaks. Yeah? And so the ROC values look almost comparable. You do get a bit of multitask improvements here in this corner, but that's not the important thing. You actually, the network didn't learn what you think it did. If you cross-validate within just one data set, you wouldn't be able to tell that this was bias. You need to either learn across multiple data sets where the bias cancels out. The network cannot use these things because they occur everywhere in all RNA binding protein data sets. Or you need to really go and look at a completely different data set and see is, if that's actually what you learned. And we've evaluated um, other approaches that learned with one model, and there are cases where the model predicts any RBP equally good than the one you actually trained on. Completely different motifs, so it really just learned the bias. Yeah? And this is something that as a computer scientist you would e easily fall prey to. Oh, I do cross-validation, I looked at independent data. Yes and no, not really independent, because you're still stuck in your one experiment with all the biases that are in there. Yeah? And so the nice thing is now we can go in and at least get at candidates where such binding sites might be disrupted. These are just some examples from MassaBlind again in the cosmic database. Um, these are variants in cancer. And you can see, yep, there are individual nucleotides that essentially destroy the binding site score and the network would predict that this binding site is lost, a couple of examples here. But the nice thing is it's, it's robust, so here when you have two motifs right next to each other and you have a variant that, uh, where you lose one, the score actually doesn't change much because there's this other site still right next to it. And of course it would also recognize if you create new sites where there shouldn't be some before by these single nucleotide variants, and we're following up on this now in much more detail. All right. So as a summary for my first much longer part, um, Machine learning can really only be as good as the biological data, and it really still helps at this point, if you know your data, to not fall prey to these biases. Yeah? Otherwise, it's hard for you to know. I told you about the interpretation of these networks. It's hard to know if the network actually learned what you wanted it to learn. Just looking at an ROC value, you might be completely misled. And so your models need to be interpretable in some ways to actually allow you to do this. But luckily, other people have done a lot of great work in the past couple of years to allow us to do this. And so in that case, it actually starts working so that we can start interpreting these non-coding variants. Um, I think there's still a need for careful probabilistic models in the data processing, like I showed you our probabilistic hierarchical model for the peak calling. It was a nice talk by Julia Zeitlinger on the first day where she had custom chip exo data on a few factors, and there they literally just predicted the raw data with the networks. If you have really nice data, apparently that's possible too. But hey, if 270 out of 17,000 sites contain your motif, good luck with that. Yeah, I don't think that we can go to that level, at least not on the RNA binding protein data that's available. And in Eclip also, there are some data sets where apparently the antibody in the end, even though they tried their best, didn't really work that well, and you have super noisy data sets there as well. So I think we're a bit stuck with still putting on some extra work here on the RNA binding protein side. All right. So in the last 10 minutes or so, five, 10 minutes, mm. I want to take you to the flip side. So what's actually, um, what can we learn if we now look at these different RNA populations? So for instance, what's the processing rates or the um, translation rates to actually put that type of information ultimately together with this information on our regulatory interactions? And so here you could look at alternative splicing as a process or uh, stability or translation, or actually also put it all together like we did a couple of years ago to actually try to completely blindly figure out what are actually potential really non-coding mRNAs and uh, discriminate them from microRNAs simply by their processing and translation localization patterns and so forth. And I want to just give you an update on this part. This is something where we've had actually some nice, made some nice headway. This is called ribosome profiling and is a method that allows us to look at translation, which before meant mass spec, 
now with RivalSeq, you can actually profile where, essentially almost like a chip, just on a ribosome. You can see it this way. It's a different chemical process, but you identify where the ribosome and fully elongating ribosome was sitting on the mRNA because it leaves a footprint of a really precise size. And that means that if you have decent quality data where also the digestion worked well and you have a strong enrichment for true footprints in your data, then you start to see these patterns here where um, there's little information or little read coverage where the ribosome scans the UTR. Typically, depending on the protocol, a peak where it starts initiating coverage along the open reading frame and then it drops off and you're done. Yeah? And we had, a, I'll just take you very briefly through this, we had a method published by now three years ago where we actually, and others at the time, realized, well, you actually start seeing three periodic patterns if your data is really good because the ribosome should move three nucleotides at a time. And so if your experiment worked, you should have this pattern and not just recoverage. So again, like with the diagnostic mutations, there are specific characteristics about your data that you can exploit to build a specific targeted approach. And of course, the data doesn't look that nice typically, but much more messy. And so we had to devise a robust way, and there are filters that are from the 80s, from essentially astrophysics, where people looked at the significance of spectra. So what you do here is you Fourier transform your input sequence profiles, and you should see essentially a frequency at one third of a hertz, uh, a nucleotide. Not a hertz, really, it's nothing moving in the air. Um, but the actual profiles look much noisier, and so there are optimal filter banks devised for that, test, uh, uh, for that task linked to statistical tests that allow you to clean up your signal and then test for the, uh, for the presence of a specific frequency. And this is what we call ribotaper because it's a so-called multi-taper test and is actually really, really nice and robust. And with this, we can go in and annotate any mRNA where the open reading frames are completely de novo. Yeah? So we take an annotated fully spliced mRNA and in this case, for instance, find two upstream open reading frames. They're annotated or if it's this gray bar and we think in this case there's no turn to start codon. But of course, you can also find new things like micropeptides, things that were too short to be annotated so far. This is a really validated case in zebrafish, a very clear cut case. There's lots of reads here. In this case, you might not need a fancy approach to find that so-called toddler gene. It's a morphogen in early zebrafish development and 50-some amino acids long. And so uh, typical RiboSeq data sets have actually coverage that's bigger than any deep proteomics data set. So this is al almost an alternative to regular tandem mass spec, just to find out what is actually translated. Yeah? And so with this, we can go in and de novo annotate and essentially find out what's translated. I'll give you just one vignette here. This is a paper that came out um, just a couple of months ago, a collaboration of ours where we did this in, in, in um, primary samples, in, in biopsies from bypass surgery and, and hearts, in human hearts. You can see that even from this data, this is not us, this is our colleagues, you can get really nice three periodic data out of these primary human samples. You can annotate then, as I meant here, you know, find essentially the full compendium of things that are translated. There was deep proteomics data that did identify a really small number of peptides that we wouldn't call as being translated. You know, maybe the data was too noisy or there's some frame shifts and other funky things that happen on canonical start codons that we didn't look for or things like that. And in this way, annotate essentially what are all the translated ORs and coding sequences also things that happen in the UTRs, and of course also potential new things coming from link RNAs. And in this case, you know, this is, it's not that there is a massive conspiracy of micropeptides that controls us and we have thousands of them in the genome, I don't believe quite that, but in this case you can see that, for instance, we found about 150 or so very credible peptides that they actually started validating then and started looking into in more detail. Um, to see whether they might be meaningful. And the length of this, and this is the nice thing, from RiboSeq data, you can start identifying ORFs de novo that are you know, 50 or 30 amino acids long, actually. And sometimes these are surprising finds. In this case, for instance, this is actually in a well-known functional link RNA. So even if people have found things as being functional as a link RNA, that doesn't mean that this thing couldn't moonlight and also harbor a micropeptide that's, for instance, in an alternative isoform. So in this case, in this cell type, the isoform was actually longer on the 5' end than was annotated. So either it was incomplete or it's 
alternative and different cell types. And that means that here we can actually generate a very solid small peptide that's actually very um, discriminative to actually discriminate also between the healthy and disease um, cardiomyopathy patients. So a few of these micropeptides are at least, if, even if they wouldn't be functional, which we don't know in most of these cases, but they would at least be really novel biomarkers to um, discriminate between different disease states. Ha, and now I run out of time. I wanted to tell you, I'll just mention what I wanted to tell you, which is, can you take riboseq analysis to the level of alternative splicing and isoforms? And the answer is there actually yes. There's also a bioarchive preprint, so I feel pretty happy to just skip this now to stick in time. Um, you can actually go through and identify and uh, from the RiboSeq data that's much cleaner essentially than RNA-seq data, what are the translated and potentially alternative open reading frames across cell types and so forth. And I have to skip all of this because I... Ta -ta 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 -ta. Uh, feel free to ask me about it and... Um, Yes, but so that second talk uh, part got a bit too short, but BioArchive has the paper. Um, in this case, I just wanted to give you a glimpse on this flip side. You know, we want to find RNA binding proteins to know where the regulatory interactions happen, but we also need protocols like RiboSeq or stability, um, nascent transcription, and so forth to really get at the processes that they regulate. Steady state RNA seq is not going to tell us this, and so that's what I wanted to just show a little vignette on things that we are doing here um, as a second part, and then I'm happy to take questions after I um, tell you who did the work. So the, most of the stuff now that I talked about was the work by Masa Gangabari. The, she's the one who uh, worked on the neural network. Um, Philip Boss um, did the peak caller. Antti is our technician. We actually have a wet lab and did, for instance, these early RiboSeq data sets also ourselves and some of the CLIP data sets that are in that network. Lorenzo is the one that actually worked on the uh, RiboSeq analysis, and Neil did this comprehensive annotation for the, all the ParkLib data sets that we could find and were good at this time. And with that, I just want to leave this slide up because I hope to see maybe some of you in Berlin in just a couple of months when we have our annual symposium there, and there's a few n names that you might recognize, and maybe you missed their talk here because of all the parallel exciting sessions. Just come to Berlin and see them there. Thank you. Uh, Uwe, a wonderful talk. Thank you so Thank much. You. Um, my question is, uh, do you see any benefits to using structural considerations mm. in your RBP predictions? So we are looking into this. There's different ways how you could get structure into this, right? The tricky thing with RBPs, what people have found so far, so there's a couple of things to keep in mind. There's sequence-specific RBPs where you would also find a specific location and have some sequence structure motif. There are others like helicases where maybe there's a start, there's some preferences where it actually starts, but then of course your par clip or clip trace would go over a large part of the transcript, so those two things we need to keep separate. For the first part, um, structural context should help. The interaction is in a single-stranded region typically, but of course that could be in a loop or a hairpin or a completely unstructured region and that would help. And so we are working on including um, shape-seek type data into this because that would be on the same nucleotide linear resolution that the rest of the networks build on. There's of course graph kernels, convolutional kernels too, in which case that would mirror more what Ralph Buckhoven talked about yesterday with representing local, a local alphabet and scanning for potential secondary structure elements. I think that would require much more work and so we are happily working on the shape-seek data. It looks okay right now. It looks like it does improve a little bit but we are not quite there yet. Thank you. Well, yeah. Wonderful talk. I, I will make only one of many questions. Just to take care of all okay. the people here. And this is about um, the small or small peptides that are coming from the long encoding RNA, mm -hmm. and you saw that they are funks, they are biomarkers in disease. Yeah. So, what do you think? These long encoding RNAs are functional. Have the dual? Are they doing the peptide which is functional and then something else? Or are they doing the peptide and nothing else? Or yeah. they are functional and they have the one or the other? No. Yeah. There are a few cases known where there is dual functions. 
Yeah? So where things that are known in, in uh, the adrenocortical gland, for instance, there's one particular RNA that works on essentially both levels. So I wouldn't be surprised if that's really the case. So I should put a few caveats oh, very quickly. So of course, um, even if you have reproducible translation events, and I think with our methods, we weed out a lot of noise where initially people thought, oh, maybe there's literally functional translation everywhere. So here we can look at replicate data. Many patients, you see again and again, this thing, it has a three nucleotide periodicity. It's not a noisy locus. It is at a, translated at a decent comparable level to protein coding transcripts. So we're not looking at noisy, crazy stuff, and so in this case, I wouldn't be surprised if that has a dual function, but I also wouldn't discredit the work of other researchers that have looked into the functions on the RNA level. Yeah. Just to understand, I mean, when we say dual function at the same time, or one time is doing the oh. one and the other? That could be any, anything. You could think of anything there. That's because we I know long non-coding yeah. RNAs yeah. can host microRNAs and produce mm -hmm. microRNAs exactly. or work, exactly. but they do the one or the other, they cannot right. do both. So we don't know if... In this case, you don't know. I mean, there's no pro further processing, so you could really think that this thing stays partially in the nucleus and has a non-coding function, but also gets exported well, will be translated. So it could be at the same time in this case because you're not processing out a microRNA and actually degrade the transcript at this time, but we don't know. But then yeah. they have to go back in again to the functional inside, or they are outside. But they are polyadenylated. We have other questions behind you, so... Yeah. Yeah. So in our case, yes, the protocol was polyunylated. And my question is related to the RNA binding proteins mm -hmm. again. Um, so you stressed the importance of the multitask learning for getting good models, yep. but your explanation was more related to having an adequate negative data set. Mm -hmm. So which part of it do you consider more important, to, to have yeah. negative data that represent your biases or multitask learning? So, so I think I just used the, the bias as one side effect that we didn't expect when we started, and it turned out to be really important. And I thought that's something to actually share and make people aware of, right? You could potentially also correct the bias straight up, but what you couldn't do is take a neural network, just throw the data for one thing in, not have an explicit bias correction, and have this network learn what you wanted. Yeah? So the multitask learning has the, uh, the added bonus of the bias correction implicitly, but also, of course, you see that things could bind together. Uh, there was a question from the reverse. I would have loved you would see more cases like this, but these composite motifs that we saw occurring at this point are largely, you know, splice side, poly A side, the landmark motifs that are in the transcript that help essentially to figure out the truth from the background sites. Um, if we have more data, you would hope that the multitask learning really starts learning also the grammar of combinatorial interactions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for a great talk. So my question is about the, the RiboSeq. Mm -hmm. um, and you mentioned that this is much cleaner than the usual RNA-seq just because the retained introns are yeah. usually not there. Now, however, I assume some must actually be there as well. I would assume that the cells sometimes will start to translate an isoform and actually you know, reach the point where the intron was retained and then sort of mm -hmm. you know, realize it's not the yeah. case. Now, is there a way to sort of decide with all these retained introns whether mm -hmm. it's sort of the noise or the leftovers mm -hmm. or whether they're actually alternative yeah. isoforms? So in the bioarchive paper, you can see one thing what we saw is that you, if you have multiple um, or detected, actually, within one cell type, often there's really a very dominant isoform. Most of the isoforms, actually, 80-some percent or so, are like 90 percent plus of your total RNAs, uh, ribosic signal. The other ones that have just a few percent turn out to be actually very frequently NMD targets. So we integrated that data, and you could actually see that they do translate into the intron, hit the stop codon, and you just see enough signal that we catch, catch it. So that is actually in the data, too. So if you're saying they're NMD targets, that would be the sort of the primary round of translation that you're capturing, and exactly. then they would disappear. Because, I mean, this is not single cell yet at this point, right? It's bulk data, so apparently we are picking up hundreds, hundreds of cases like that. Let's uh, thank Uwe again for a wonderful talk. Thank you.